Hello, this is Anna Davis with this week's On Farm and thank you again for being with us. This episode is a really fascinating chat with, and now bear with me, there's a bit of a long list coming up, the first parliamentarian to be sworn into the Holyrood Parliament building after it was first opened, the former farming editor of both the Scotsman and the Dundee Courier, an author whose books have raised over £100,000 for RSABI, a farmer and a champion pole vaulter. So quite a list there. You might think that uh, I'm speaking to many different people, but no, in fact, just one man I'm speaking to today, but I will let him introduce himself. I'm Andrew Arbuckle. Uh, up until 1989, I farmed, and then I find it easier to write about it and report it than it was actually to do it. Uh, and since then, I've been the farming editor of The Courier and more recently The Scotsman, and now a, a freelance and, and, and do comic pieces. So do, would you consider yourself to be semi-retired? Is that an accurate description, do you think? Yes, yes. But, uh, I find it's, uh, it's quite easy to do less, but still claim to be working full-time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you need to give me tips then, because I would like to do less and still claim to be working full time. But uh, right. now, Andrew, before we start, I'm going to declare an interest here because uh, you and I are related, aren't we? Um, my mother is your one of your many first cousins. So you two have known each other since you were certainly since you were in short trousers and, and before that. Um, so some of the questions I'm going to ask you today, I might already know the answer, but not all of our listeners will. So excuse me if I'm asking you what appear to be kind of obvious questions. Um, can you first of all talk us through, uh, can you go back to, to when you were a young child and tell us a bit about your childhood and your family and where you grew up and what you did? Yes, I uh, grew up on a family farm, a tenanted farm in North, North Fife. As I grew up, I found out that all my cousins were virtually involved in farming. That has now changed that there's very few left in farming. I think it's, it's part of the developments within agriculture, less people being involved. Yeah, well, that is true. Automation is has got a lot to answer for, hasn't it, in terms of yeah. people uh, and bodies working on farms. So far fewer people involved in the sector than there were back then. Oh, yes, it's... The parish in which I live just now, I think in my childhood, there were 30 or 40 men employees, and now I think there's two. Mm. But there's also machinery getting bigger and that combine swoop in and clear a whole field in a day where in my childhood there would be, we'd spend a week cutting it with a binder and stooking it and all the other hard back breaking things that we did. Yeah. A bit more about that. You you were one of how many children? Uh, I had two older brothers and one younger sister. So four of you were you roped into doing a lot of work on the farm then because it, it needed so so much labour. Oh yes, uh, in, in those days, the growing up, we picked potatoes for example, we fed the hens, and that was the job when you came home from school was to feed the hens, and they they were fed before you got your tea. So it was quite a good incentive. As we'll come to in a little bit, you farmed for the first half of your career. Did you always think as a small boy that, that farming was the career that you wanted to go to or did, did you kind of end up evolving into it? What, how, how strong was your passion for farming? Uh, that's a very difficult question because on the one hand, perhaps I took, like others of my generation, I took the easy option to come into farming. With hindsight, I wish... I had looked elsewhere and done other things. I'd always had an interest in writing. I enjoyed writing, and, uh, and that's the way it stood out. What are your clearest sort of memories of your days in farming? You know, these days, as you say, you write about it. So you're writing about milk prices. You're writing about Brexit and the impact that that has. But back when you were a practical farmer, what, what are the things that you remember dealing with or some of the challenges that were kind of most prevalent back then? Well, the main enterprises were seed potatoes and soft fruit. Uh, both of them labour intensive, both requiring uh, being able to handle large squads of labour and that. So I, I, I enjoyed uh, working with other people. Yeah, that, that was definitely one. So sometimes when things went wrong and the, the rain came on when you were just starting to pick strawberries, it was just a nightmare. But uh, 
I've, I've still got the marks for, for that, yeah. Do you think farming was easier in some ways back then or harder? I mean, there will be certain, you know, as we've said already, automation makes certain processes easier. But, um, you know, it's a bit like school kids, you know, people are always saying, oh, the A-levels, they just get easier and easier, you know. What do you think, looking back and understanding what you do about modern farming, looking back, was it tougher? Or easier? It was definitely physically harder. And I have a sore back thanks to, for example, thinning sugar, sugar beet. We spent two or three weeks every year thinning sugar beet. It was a desperate job. And we no sooner got monogerm seed and made it the job easier than the sugar beet factory closed, which was, was rather ironic. But I think the main difference between now and, and then, then it, it was the physical side was quite hard, whereas now it's a I think there's a lot more mental stress than, than there used to be. Mm. That's a very good point, actually. And, you know, we hear a lot about the mental kind of overwhelm that that many people feel in in farming at the moment. So, do you think that is more of a a, a recent thing, or do you think maybe people just hid it better back then? Well, I, I think they either hid it better, or I would rather say that they they had because they're often working. Not alone, but with with other people. There, there was always, even without revealing their own mental worries and that, there was always somebody to chat to. And I think that that did sort of help to to kind of relieve some of it. And I mean, it's only a good thing that people feel more able and more comfortable to talk about it out with the you know their immediate family and colleagues now. And, and I think. Um, Many people wouldn't get the help that they they need and deserve if if they weren't able to speak up. And I think it's amazing that that the likes of RSABI and others have enabled people to feel more comfortable to 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 share their worries. Yes, uh, I, I think that has been one of the major step forwards in agriculture in the last two two or three years that people are more open about the, the mental hurdles that they face and, and that. Mm. So you did. You did a good few years on the farm, hurting your back and physically working really hard. Was there a moment when you thought, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm going to go and do something else? Or was it a kind of a longer evolution that kind of dawned on you, this this isn't for me, I'm going to try something else? How did the transition go? I, I was uh, contributing a, m- a monthly column to, to one of the farming magazines. And I realised when I dashed off the latest uh, chapter of that uh, that gosh, I've been paid more for doing that than than I, I was. Uh, that that was a, a ton of barley at that time. I was like, gosh, I did that, and uh, it's the cool of the, It might be easier do, doing writing. And at that time, there was a, uh, an opportunity arose to join the Courier as farming editor. I would also say that my two daughters are they they're not in farming. They weren't coming back to farm, so. Uh. Yeah. So, I suppose going back even further, you must have been fairly good in terms of concentrating and being on your best behaviour when you were at school to have developed the skills of, of writing because it's not as easy as a lot of people imagine. You know, just because you can read or write doesn't mean you're going to be good at writing. So was was school an enjoyable time for you? Is that where you kind of learn your writing skills? <laughs> not at all. No. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed my time at school very much, but um, I wasn't a good scholar. I wasn't top of the class or, or anything. I used to... Um, We'd get up every week. I would be sent home with homework to to write an essay, and I can remember badgering my mother to the extent that, to get her to write it for me, and that was all right until she, she was writing about uh, the subject was my favourite uncle, and uh, I chose my uncle who happened to be also your uncle, John Watson. Oh yes, yes. The mum did a good job writing it. When I handed it in, the teacher said, what's this word that you use? Hirsute. And I had not the foggiest idea of what. And I, and I, so I just, I just stood there blushing and eventually I confessed that my mother had written it. 
<laughs> so it must have been her that you got your writing skills from. Then it sounds as though she was she was good with words. Was she? Yeah, I think she she was very frustrated that uh, when she came home from she was brought home from school at the earliest opportunity, and her job was to to sort of help in the house. And and I think in a current era, she would have gone off to be a teacher or a, something else, and maybe a successful PR lady. Maybe, maybe. Um, certainly, well, certainly sounds that she, as though she helped you out. But there must have been a point at which you took over and started the writing yourself. So I'm kind of curious. Maybe, maybe there wasn't a moment. Maybe it just kind of happened. But um, how did how did you discover that having been palming the homework off to your mother previously, that actually you had a talent for this yourself? Uh, oh gosh. What, these are very difficult questions, Anna. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think it's you know, writing is like any other skill. The, the more you do, it does become easier. Mm. There, there is a, a lot of the farming writing is routine, you know, reporting on sales and, and shows. So you get into, you know, how the routine works. And it's only, only then can you branch out and write comic pieces and, Say what you think about the latest minister of agriculture or the this or that policy. Yeah. So somebody at some point asked you if you would write a column. You must have said yes um, because you started that, and then, as you said, you realised that maybe you could uh, make more money from doing that as your job rather than uh, than farming. Um, so how did the the move go from one career to a very very different one? To be frank, it was quite difficult. Was it? Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. Because my friends and neighbours from farming said, Andrew's giving up the tenancy here. And they equated that with failure. Mm. I lost, well, one or two of my so-called friends just didn't want to be associated with anybody who came out of farming. Uh, so it was tough. Uh, and it was only six months or a year or uh, later that uh, and farming went into a, a, a dip in its uh, profitability. And I can remember one, one chap who hadn't spoken to me since I gave up. He said, you did the right thing. You got out. Yeah. Gosh, that's, I, that's surprising. I've, I've, I've never really, I suppose, and I've never really been forced to think about that before. But you know, farming has its huge benefits for being such a close-knit community. But then sometimes individuals kind of let you down just because you don't conform to the way that you're expected to conform, that's that's really sad that, that they kind of judged you for making what actually was a very brave decision. The easy thing would just have been to carry on doing what you'd always done, I suppose. Yes, yeah, there's no disguising the fact it was tough to begin with until, mm-hmm. uh, as I say, help my farming becoming unprofitable. Uh, I can always remember, it's slightly off the, that line, but one long-term friend, they said, I hadn't seen him for a while. And he said, what are you right is fine, he said, but what are you working at nowadays? <laughs> there was no thought that we are writing was work. Yeah. So, yes, uh, yes. Mind you, another line, similar line, when I was in the newspaper office, I, and I said I wouldn't be in next week because I, I was off to Smithfield Shores or Royal Shores, Highland Shores, something like that. And when you went back into the office after the event, other people in the office would say, how did your holiday go? Uh, if anybody has been reporting on the Highland show, you know it's not a holiday, it's just... <laughs> no, not even a busman's holiday. There's nothing holiday about it. Maybe enjoyable, but uh, not terribly relaxing. You mentioned the Highland show there, actually. Are you one of these people that's... Be- we spoke to... Um, Tom Middlemas, who you might know from here yes. in East Lothian, and he was saying that I think he said he'd never missed a show for fifty years or something. Uh, are you one of those people who's never missed at least the ones that have gone on, never missed a show? No, no, I, mean, I, I can't say that. I, before I became a full time writer, I would go to the the show if it suited the, my work at, on the farm. I wasn't. I was never a livestock farmer, so I had to adjust and take up, uh, you know, become involved in livestock and therefore shows and sales and 
and that. So, so yes, no, I, yeah. I don't have a long list of long service medals to the Highland Shore. <laughs> Will will we see you there this summer, do you think? I, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think it gets back to normality, although it's a bit difficult to see. I, they've had a time, the directors have had a tough, tough time keeping it afloat. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't like to speculate on what form it takes. No, well, I very much hope that it returns to normal, as I'm sure they do. And I very much hope that I'll I'll see you there too. Um, but so so we've kind of talked about your transition to journalism from farming, which which does sound really tough. And and yeah, gosh, it must have been a really difficult time. But what was it like then becoming a full time journalist? Um, did you have a bit of a kind of shock to the system in some ways, or or, or were you thinking, oh, phew? My back doesn't hurt anymore. It's just uh... <laughs> yeah. There, there, there was the physical changes. There was all there was sufficient challenges in the new job to you know keep me fully occupied. I can remember sit, sitting on the press bench at an NFU meeting, and some of my colleagues were busy writing what the speaker was saying word for word with, with an excellent shorthand, and I had no eyes. I had no shorthand, and I had no typing skills, and so. It was quite a learning curve to change. And um, do you remember how many years were you at the Courier for before you, you moved on? Yeah, 1989 to 2005. January 2005, I was elected to the Scottish Parliament. Well, yes, the, the next chapter in your career journey. Um, tell us a bit about that, because, I mean, you've done more careers than most people I know, I think. And at the end, I'm curious to find out which one, if any, was, was your favourite. But, yeah, tell us a bit about your parliamentary uh, years. Well, I'd been involved in local politics for 15, 20 years, serving my local area as a, as a councillor. That, uh, for some reason, sort of I had a sufficient support to be top of the, of the list. And when the previous list MSP resigned unexpectedly, I was told that it, uh, I was in Parliament. And I was the, the first uh, MSP to be sworn in at Holyrood in the new, new building. So You were the first? I didn't know that. That's amazing. That's such a claim to fame. It's, uh, well, um, yeah, and then I went on to be First Minister. But... <laughs> No, no, it, it was a bit like a bit like joining school at half term, halfway through the school year. You know, everybody knew, well, one, of, one they knew their way about the building, and two, they knew the, the procedures and the committees and everything. So it was quite a big learning curve. Was there. A, another learning curve, yeah, yeah. And I suppose farming maybe would have been different, but in journalism and in politics... Not everybody is going to like what you say, and so how how have you dealt with that in those two different careers? Because um, you know, it kind of depends a bit whether you're thick skinned or thin skinned. But some people would find it pretty tough, regardless of the career that they're in. I think in journalism, you do what is right, and sometimes you have to write articles that are not popular. It may offend some people, but if you feel that they're right, or they should be reported. And that's quite straightforward. Uh, but in Parliament, all your colleagues, are, they see and weigh everything up in a political light. And that, I actually found that more difficult, you know. Yeah. So in a sense, are you saying it kind of a little bit less about always doing what feels right and a little bit more about kind of political strategy and uh, and that kind of thing? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, one example. Uh, there was a review into transport priorities in the Scottish government, and I was interviewed, and I said, I thought one of the, just as an example, one of the priorities should be a dual carriage, making a dual carriage from Firth up to Inverness right away. My goodness, by the time I, I got into Parliament after doing that recording, the transport minister was on my head. I had no right to say that. That was not in the, you know, I, you know, it, it was... Well, off limits. It, it, it wasn't in the programme and therefore I shouldn't speak, speak about it. So, uh, yeah, looking back on it, uh, it was a tremendous experience. I should have done better, but... Um, 
I well, I th- I think you made an, a, a massive contribution, and that's probably all any politician can ever say. Really, they're they're, they're never going to be universally popular in their in their opinions and and policies. But um, no, I mean at the time I watched you eagerly, and I I think you did a, a great job. But but after that, you then moved back to journalism, and then was it was it after your your stint at Holyrood that that you wrote your first book, or had you already written a book before that? Uh, when I came out of Parliament in April uh, 2007, I thought, what am I going to do? Uh, but the, there was no vacancies at that point, uh, and I thought I'd write about my farming experience. Put that footsteps in the furrow, which went on to sell about 5,000 copies. Yeah. And um, was that difficult? Because somewhere in the depths of me is a desire to write a book. Uh-huh. Probably a novel rather than than a, anything sort of factual or biographical. But I'm scared. I don't know where to start. How, you know, how do you s- start with when you're going to? It's just the enormity of the task just puts me off. So any tips you've got would be gratefully received. How did you get going? Well, first of all, to start, remember the old Chinese proverb: the longest journey starts with a single step. So make with a single step, and uh, you got to call it something attractive to the. A casual reader, the secrets of a PR lady. <laughs> I I probably talk too much that I don't have any secrets left. I've told them to everybody. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it was quite a simple, straightforward theme. It was just really recording farming in my lifetime and possibly the previous lifetime. Just just in case anybody needs to know or would like to know, Footsteps in the Furrow, how do people get hold of a, cof- a copy? It's still in print, presumably. Uh, it's, sadly, it's not. Oh. Yeah, but uh, I think there's uh, sufficient to, you can Google it and pick up the uh, old copies. Uh, right, there we go then, that's what we need. One, one project I could do would be to update it because that came out in 2007, so it's 15 years old. So. Mm. And there's a lot, a lot of a lot has happened. There's a lot has happened in the industry, so I'll maybe do it. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, my mum knows this even better than I do. But um, you, you are also. I don't. I'm not going to say a comedian, but uh, have a fantastic sense of humour. So you've also written a book with sort of, I guess, humorous and interesting farming tales, haven't you? Can you tell me a bit more about that? The when they joined the press, I uh, would go to every press, every NFU meeting, every uh, sort of meeting, and often the speakers would, you know, would tell a story. And the trouble with the press was we'd heard all a lot of these stories beforehand. And for Dice Maxwell, was, uh, you know, we were sitting in the press, he'd whisper along, he says, I think he's going to tell joke number 15, you know, that we'd heard it before and, and that. So, uh, and from that, I, th- I thought, I'd like to collect all the stories. And I thought, like, I'll donate all the proceedings to RSABI. And folk were very generous. Uh, I I would have collated them. Uh, but it was good fun. Although, though my sense of humour was pretty strained by the end, yes. <laughs> but a very, very worthy cause. And a book that probably gave you a lot of satisfaction because of that, did it? Yeah, yes, it did. Yeah. Just to show what a poor businessman I am. But when I first uh, punted the idea to RSABI, they said, what did I want paid for it? And I said, well, give me 10 free copies. They give to my relations. Uh, and um, <laughs> I didn't say because they're all too mean to buy their own copies. <laughs> I didn't say. <laughs> I hope you're not lumping my mum into that category. <laughs> She'll be on the phone to you if you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask her if she paid for her own. Yeah. <laughs> no, but people were very generous to set in their stories. And that book and two subsequent books have raised over 100,000. Amazing. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Fant- it's a fantastic charity. We've spoken with them and about them many times and we will continue to on the podcast. Um, and in fact, Carol McLaren, who is the new chief executive of RSABI, is a good friend of yours, isn't she? Yeah, we, we, we used to travel with the various you know, farming conferences when she was uh, doing her uh, agricultural reporting. I first came across Carol at a young farmer's speech making when she was in the, the Perth team and my daughter Lydia was in the Fife team. So. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. 
So you've written books kind of in between everything else. And then for a while you were, as you said, farming editor of The Scotsman. And um, now um, you're, you're freelance. So what are you doing just now? And, and if, there are, if you've got any kind of interesting tales about your years at The Scotsman as well, I'd love, love to hear those. I sort of slipped into the Scotsman position because the previous farming editor was Dan Buglis, a super reporter, but sadly it's, it's affected by alcohol, alcoholism. One day he just didn't appear and the Scotsman phoned me and asked if I could fill in. From that position I became the farming editor, which I retained for 10 years, and I never met anybody on the Scotsman. I've never went over the the office door. Goodness. And so that you you were remote working long before uh, anybody else and certainly uh, long before the pandemic forced us all to do it. Gosh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah Dan Buglis, what a lovely man he was. But um, yeah, sad, sad what happened to him and you you filled his boots. Well, one of the best reporters that I know, and a complete enthusiast for the industry. Possibly too much so, and that you in, perhaps you should have been more critical because we, we all see things in the reporting world that are right and we know they're not right, and we should just be brave enough to say that. Mm, true. So te- yeah, ten years at the Scotsman, um, but you're st- you're still writing. So you're filling in for people if they are on holiday or um, need a break. Have you got any more books on the horizon? Yes, I've got. Uh, I do have books on the horizon. Well. I've got three half books. Oh, my goodness. But for some one reason or another, you get to a certain stage and think, this is just fading away, so you stick it away. And uh, Sadly, three half books don't make up one book. <laughs> have I missed any parts of your career? Have you, had, have you had any other jobs that I'm unaware of that we should discuss before I ask you which one has been your favourite or most memorable? I was... Uh, if you want a, a completely off the wall fact, <laughs> I was a Scottish men's over sixty year old pole vault champion. Are you serious? I'm serious. That is unbelievable. Look above my ear. Do you see it? Yes, I can see it. The pole. Yes. Oh my word! Evidence. Yes. <laughs> the Scottish men's over sixties pole vault champion. And are we allowed to know what height you were able to clear, or is that confidential? I think it was marginally above this, the, the world high jump record. Wow, I, I, this is unbelievable. Is it on YouTube? Can we go and watch it? <laughs> no, 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 it was something about 3 metres 60, something like that. Wow, this is a, one of the most interesting facts I've ever heard on this <laughs> podcast. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> As somebody said, there's not many people who do it, so you... you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, probably not that many people over 60, I would guess, but I might be wrong. Yeah. So all of these different jobs, the pole vaulting is a total shot in the dark. I wasn't expecting that. Which has been either your favourite or your most memorable? Or maybe if you were to have your life all over again, the one that you'd pick. Anything kind of stand out more than the others? I've enjoyed them all. They satisfied me in different ways. But when I, when I farmed, I was young and physically fit and I enjoyed the physical challenge. And then I enjoyed the challenge of writing uh, and then really, really putting a good piece together. So I, and I, what skills I have have been pretty thinly spread upon the ground. I've, I've enjoyed dab, dabbing in things, in politics or in, in farming or whatever. So... Uh, wow, well, we, I think you've made excellent use of all of your skills, particularly pole vaulting. <laughs> oh dear, but not going to demonstrate it anyway. Oh, okay, no, when we, when we turn the podcast into a video, we'll get you to demonstrate it. But at the moment, nobody would be able to see anyway. They might just hear a crash. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. I just wanted to say thank you. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I know that many of our listeners will enjoy it too. I, I've had a brilliant time. Thank you very much for speaking to us and uh, yeah, keep up the writing. I look forward to the next book. Well, best wishes to your mum and dad. Yeah, my mum and dad, every podcast goes out on a Monday morning and my mum and dad always go out for a walk and sit on a bench 
in the sunshine, hopefully, and listen to the podcast. So they'll be listening to this as soon as it goes out. Andrew Arbuckle there, a really, really interesting chat. As you may have picked up, Andrew and I are relatives and I knew a lot about him, but I did not know uh, about the pole vaulting uh, championship. So that was really, really fascinating to hear. Thank you very much again for listening to On Farm. As you may know, it's made by the team here at Seen and Heard PR and Marketing. So do chat to us at any time if you have any communications, PR or podcasting needs for your rural business and meantime have a great week and we will see you next time